Hi, welcome to How to Build a Service Catalog Taxonomy in Four Steps. My name is Stephanie, and joining me today is Don Casson, CEO of Evergreen Systems, and Jeff Benedict, our ITSM Practice Manager. A few quick notes. You are on mute today. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A panel. You can access this on the right side of your screen or from the toolbar. Also, you will note above and to the right of the slide you are seeing now, there is a set of double arrows pointing outwards. You can use those to go to full screen mode. You may find this helpful later when Jeff Benedict does his demo. And now I'm going to turn it over to Don Casson, CEO of Evergreen Systems. Thank you, Stephanie. Good afternoon. Hey, everybody, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm Don Casson, as Steph said, CEO of Evergreen, and with me is Jeff Benedict, who heads up Evergreen's ITSM practice and is a, a terrific solutions architect to boot. We, uh, here's our agenda for the day. Uh, we do have a lot of ground to cover. Uh, I'm pretty excited about this one because it's a really interesting topic that we get a lot of questions on. So I'm going to try to talk a little bit faster today, if that's imaginable. Uh, if you are new to our series of webinars, thank you for joining us and welcome. If you're a past attendee, thanks for joining us again. Our goal is to share valuable information and insights that you can use in your planning and activities right now. The question we'll explore today is, how do we go about building a service taxonomy? So here's our agenda after a little bit about Evergreen, and we'll look at the definition and benefits of a taxonomy, a four-step building process, and three you know, key mistakes that you want to try to avoid. Beyond that, we'll briefly demonstrate our always evolving view of the advanced user-centric service catalog and employee self-service kind of interface built directly on ServiceNow. Then you will, will answer any questions that you guys may pose during the process. If you have a question during the webinar, you can submit it using the Q&A function. So let's, uh, here's a real brief uh, <clears throat> about Evergreen. Evergreen is a US-based consulting firm and we've worked with hundreds of mid-market and Fortune 1000 companies to improve their IT service management execution. We're a full life cycle firm, or as one customer put it, you have both process and technology in one company. We are one of the leading ServiceNow partners and have over a decade of domain expertise and experience in each of their portfolio areas. But we have a particularly heavy focus on customer-centric IT service management. A lot of you have or may eventually use ServiceNow. It's a great flexible platform. This is what the end user experience looks like out of the box on the left hand side versus Evergreen's out of the box. You know, like the eye doctor says during an eye examination, this or this, which is better? The, the real question to ask is which might your customer prefer? And speaking of the customer, at Evergreen, we think that conventional ITS, ITSM wisdom is basically wrong. For the most part, ITSM has been done the same old way for the past decade, incident, problem, change, and a little bit of knowledge. At the end of it, we may be running better, a little better, but so what? You know, what about the customer? Are we making a difference in their lives? Are we delivering them any more value? Are we waiting to phase three to even think about them? This whole model is broken. We need to start with the customer in phase one. And if you haven't already, now's a great time to do so. For the past two years at Evergreen, we've been working really hard on exactly this, focusing from the customer in, not IT out. We see both IT and the customer experience evolving hand in hand from the start, not as an afterthought. On the left side of this slide, you can see IT maturing, going from silos of IT activities to delivering IT services to being an engine behind delivery of any service. On the right side, the customer experience is evolving as well, from what I call not really a very good one, to being able to access a thoughtful and complete portfolio of services, IT services in most cases for most organizations, and then eventually being empowered by a true digital workspace to drive their productivity and creativity. So here we go. Let's start with some definition of terms. You've seen this one before, if you've been on the past webinars, what is a service? A service is an outcome that meets a customer's needs well enough to justify the purchase price. And the purchase price is not just money. It's the total investment the customer has to make to get the service, time, energy, and money. It also considers ease of use, quality, and complexity as the customer moves through the process, just like you do when you are the customer of a service. A service taxonomy 
is, is a logical, repeatable way to classify the services we want to offer, as well as the ones we might want to offer. The taxonomy of Homo sapiens here is a pretty good type of taxonomy model for IT services. The classification goes from very broad to specific, from millions to few or one. A taxonomy is a logical and extensible way of classifying things. Most taxonomies organize things into categories, groups, subgroups, even sub-subgroups as the classification gets more and more specific. Taxonomies don't have to be hierarchical. They can be alphabetic listings of things as well. The best type of taxonomy for you is the type that is most useful in creating and managing the services you want to offer. It's helpful if the taxonomy includes or carries with it the principles of classification in the framework itself. One common way to do this is to use self-defining terms. In other words, a term generally understood to be the same thing by a high percentage of the target customer for that group of services. Here's an example. The term high-powered desktop computer is more self-defining for more customers than compute hardware 64-bit Linux OS v5. The parts of the taxonomy are meant to be parts of a whole. At the highest level, the framework should capture the broadest view of what you see as potentially within the scope of your effort. Of course, the taxonomy can be grown or shrunk later. It's never really locked down, but it's easier to start with a broad view as there's no downside to it. You don't have to use all of it right away, and you will minimize reclassification efforts downstream that could come from changing the taxonomy later. Here's an interesting note. It is possible for a child's object in a taxonomy to have multiple parents, just like in idle, a CI can be a component or involved in many different services. You could have a category like HR with a group training and a subgroup IT training. At the same time, IT training could be a group or a subgroup under the category IT customer services. So what are the benefits of building a taxonomy? Here are six really good ones. Since we'll have a number of constituents, customers, and providers with varying interest in building and maintaining our taxonomy, having a commonly understood way to group and classify items helps in the consistent definition and categorization of services. This consistency also brings clarity amongst the constituents as a strong general group understanding of the use of the framework develops. Being able to see and handle the framework easily from high to low helps to shine a light on redundant or unnecessary services, <clears throat> excuse me, thereby simplifying the service catalog as well as ensuring individual services are built in the most simple reusable form. A well understood classification system makes it much easier to align services in logical groups and this helps to eliminate cultural or organizational biases around those services. The classification scheme, along with a consistent way of ranking the potential value and cost of new incoming demand, provides better, less biased insight in defining priorities. A clear, consistently understood framework with its attendant services that are attached to it makes it easier to identify services or subservices services that can be combined to create new services. There you don't have to start from scratch, driving up beneficial reuse. So here we go in the four steps. While there's a lot of guidance around service catalogs and service portfolios, there doesn't seem to be very much guidance around IT service taxonomies. And yet, we've had dozens of clients ask us about the best practices in these kinds of things in taxonomies in just the past quarter. So here are our four steps to building a service taxonomy. Because of the lack of standards on the topic, we need to lay some groundwork to ensure what we build is durable. We've already discussed the high-level definition of a taxonomy. So for step one, what's our purpose? Okay, for starters, here's a working definition you may use. The purpose of a service taxonomy is to provide a commonly agreed upon classification framework that allows us to manage a portfolio of services over their useful lives. Seems pretty straightforward. Why do we need it? To provide those six good things, consistency, clarity, simplicity, alignment, priority, and reuse for the services offered to our customers. 
then who is served by it? This is up to you, and it's defined by how broadly you construe it. Here's a useful tip. Typically, any given functional unit within a business provides something to someone. So they have customers, and they have services. For a customer of HR, the ability to get 401k information is a service. For the customer of IT, the ability to reset a password is a service. For the customer of the server compliance team, who could actually be a server administrator, the ability to launch an automated patch update process is a service. Step two, the service taxonomy needs to be durable and is critical for success in services. For step two, we begin with the governance team. Everyone hates that term, I know. I don't even like it. Once we have a view as to how broader taxonomy is, we can identify a key customer, the key customer and provider groups that can form our governance committee. A simple charter, along with the definition of how the taxonomy is defined and changed, will suffice to start. That can all be on one page. Then a small working group of three to four, emphasis on small and working, people will define and document the taxonomy interacting with the governance group on a monthly basis. Not that difficult. For many IT organizations, the framework is mostly about IT services, at least at the start, and even more specifically, customer-facing IT services. This is fine. Non-IT service groups like HR and facilities can be added pretty easily later as there is a minimal risk of having to reclassify your services in the different groups. There's not much overlap there. So how do we manage demand? For those of you who've been doing this, once a service catalog is visible, especially if it has a beautiful and functional user interface, demand for new services can grow quickly, both from IT and non-IT sources. You need a new service request kind of intake funnel, demand intake funnel. Not a complex thing either. This can be built in a simple spreadsheet and has two perspectives, benefit and cost. On the benefit side, you weight the value of a potential service. How many can or will use it? How does it benefit the business? How much time does it save? What, if any, strategic impact does it, does it have? Not hard questions. On the cost side, you weight the cost and risk of a service. What will it cost to develop? Consider reuse here. Do we already have a service that does most of what is needed? How much complexity or risk of failure is there in the potential development? Then you combine both sides for a calculated value score. This is a way you communicate with your constituents that are requesting demand to rank their service requests in a consistent, in a nice way that they can understand. May not agree with because they all feel theirs are priority one, understood, but it gives you a consistent basis for communicating back. While all steps are important, this is where the taxonomy framework actually uh, itself is actually built. We found that a hierarchical framework like the one we showed about the species works very well for IT services. This approach goes from general to specific and from category to group to subgroup to service. Now, you can, you can label those however you want. You just want to apply a consistent approach as you drill down through the taxonomy. So how do we group logically? That's a really good question, and we've had that from a lot of customers. We have to consider both the customers and the providers of a service to get good service taxonomy groupings. For example, let's say we're working on a customer-facing part of our service taxonomy, and we want to have a high-level category related to getting access to things and security considerations, trying to keep it in the customer's self-defining term base. We would go to the providers and find out what services they think they provide to their customers. And, and this is you when I say we, or it could be us together. Then we would talk to the customers to refine what is offered. What really is a service to them? And then define it in the most simple way, easily understood by the customer. This is step 3A, because I didn't have a five-step process. Here are some good general framework practices to follow. Some of these are not unlike what you do when you create a good incident classification schema. Very, very similar. Try to target seven or less selections per category. And when I'm saying category, that's kind of your highest order, your highest level of, of options in the taxonomy in an area. Then try to limit the number of hops from the highest level category to the actual service, which they can consume from four to six. Okay? Bear in mind, the schema is a balancing exercise in breadth and depth. So you want to you go from general to specific, and you might want to go 
you know, from smaller to broader, from, a, from small choices to more choices. Going broader at the end is not all bad. You might even have 10 or 15 items, services, under a subgroup because you're drilling down to the customer's real focused interest level, so they'd be okay with more options. Then work to simplify, use as few words as possible, and define the services as mentioned in the customer's terms. Okay, so I'm gonna to get to demo something today. This is the first time in one of our webinars. So this is a, I mean, we don't know what's gonna happen, but you get to observe it live. The, uh, <clears throat> they don't let me touch a lot of the stuff. So here we have an idea of what a simple high level taxonomy looks like. This is a sample of it, uh, and we actually, I'll show you, we built this in a, in, a, in a mind mapping technology, and that sounds really powerful. It's quite simple, actually, and it's a graphical tool for, for looking at these sorts of things. So I'm going to shift over to that, pop out of presentation mode. Okay, so this is, this, this is a, a simple application called XMind, right? And as I mentioned, everybody asked about this, so we went ahead and built it. And this is kind of based on dozens of customers and another 20 or so frameworks we could find and, and distill. Here's a partial example of it. This is not all of it. As you can see, this is pretty broad at the highest levels. Lots of non-IT services over here. And on the left side, there are two IT service categories, which I'll talk to in a second. So building and refining a taxonomy is a workshop activity with that group of people we talked about. And having a really fast and easy way to visually do it helps a lot. We've tried to do this in spreadsheets. It is not fun. We have built a good starting place for your taxonomy here. Generally, 70 to 80% of what you will need or want, we believe, will be in here. And we'll highlight it in our demo around ServiceNow today as well, a taxonomy, uh, and we'll talk about how that can be applied from one to the other. All right, so here in this high level, Let's look, just for fun, even though we're looking at IT today, let's look at one of these other services. It's not IT. So we open this one, HR. You see there's a lot of HR things you might want to do, right? It, it's not necessarily all of them, but it's a pretty good set. And then here's one we all recognize as one of our favorite ones for automation demonstrations, employee onboarding or contractor onboarding or offboarding. Right? So these could be actual services that you could then light up as a consumer of it, right? Then we look down here and we can see, oh, here's some role changes. And then there could be services around promotion or termination or transfer. And if we go down to training, this is fun too. There could be corporate specific, there could be uh, continuing ed, or there could be a cross link to training under IT. This is that multiple parent of a child kind of idea. This same thing might be under IT services that are customer facing because the customers might would expect to find it either place, even though it's the same thing, the same set of things, right? So you can see how that can work. So if we go over to uh, IT, you, you will notice we've got two categories here, right? Customer facing and IT internal. And you'll, you'll hear these terms, business catalogs, IT catalog, different, how many different service catalogs do we need? Our view of it really is that it's one catalog, we have one service taxonomy with the components that make sense, right? And in this case, we found that, that this is a hard distinction for companies to make, and what happens is they roll all these things together. Right? And you end up getting service catalogs that confuse everyone because there's so many services there that don't apply to someone. And it's hard to filter out what they see from that perspective, right? So we've taken it this way and said, let's look at it this way. And you'll see they, they are quite different. If we look here on internal services, right? Here's the kind of things internal IT organizations do. Move this over a little bit so you can see it, right? And you could say, well, a lot of those titles make sense to a customer, but they might not. Because as we go a little deeper, we'll open up application and database services, and we look in here, and we've got dev and release, hosting and delivery, app support. You open up dev and release. Well, these are pretty IT-oriented kind of activities, right? These are services, though, to people that consume the application and database service needs, the people that are involved in these activities, right? So these are still services. Let's see. You can see why that would be a little bit different than what's customer facing. So let's go up here and take a look at that. And these are the distilled categories, the high level categories for customer facing services. And this is the primary focus of most service catalog and taxonomy efforts today for most organizations. We do have eight categories and I said you want to try to stick to seven so I'm one over. And, and we have compressed this pretty hard. So you can see that challenge 
and we've tried again, write them in things that make sense. But having more than eight, well, there becomes an issue, right? At some point when you have 20, people, people are turned off by it. It's too many choices. It's too hard to use at that point. So let's open this one up here, service desk. That's a popular one, right? And we've got all the kind of things you would see normally in a service desk. And if we open popular services, well, here's some cool stuff. Tune my PC, reset my password. These are things that people we think might be very interested in, or maybe the things that have a lot of demand, right? What's interesting here is the way they're grouped in the taxonomy. See how we follow this trail out here? That has nothing to do with the way they might be presented to a customer. Right? In the, in the self-service portal, they might be in a scrolling banner in a pop-up entitled Hot Now or even found via search bar. So there's lots of ways to find the services. You don't always just go through a taxonomy. Given that that's the case, you can see, though, the value of a taxonomy in helping us keep our sanity. So now let's do this. We'll go a little bit further here. And we're going to go to personal computing mobility. So we look at that. And here we're trying to make sure we cover you know, all the options that are in personal computing and mobility so that people don't have to go other places. We open mobile. Then we've got iOS and Android. We look a little bit further. We've got, B, we've got mobile bundles. We could have three or four bundles out here if we wanted to at specific services. Or we can click on BYOD, and these are services. I can add one, remove, update one, or remove one. So you can see how the services kind of hang off at the, end of this, at the end of this branching. But it's all pretty logical, too. Then if we go down here, and we can say, let's look at the stuff that looks like hardware. And we can see, man, these are the kind of compute things we might want to have, or things that are supporting computing things that we use. So if we look at a desktop, Windows and Mac, and we open that, hey, here's three bundled services we can buy, a basic bundle, a medium bundle, advanced bundle. You can add more, and this also helps drive, you know, consistent activity by your customers and simplifies IT as you start to simplify the things that you're doing. Let's see if there's anything else I wanted to talk to you about in here. Uh, yes, software and apps. Now, this is kind of cool because we're trying to capture everything here. We're looking at installed software, cloud software, and mobile apps. So here are titles that you might have, and it's just it's a small set for things that you're going to install on your laptop or your desktop. And you got cloud. Say, oh, these are the cloud-approved applications that are in the corporation, and I can get those from here too. Right? That's nice. And then we go down even further, and we can have mobile apps. So we are creating an enterprise software and app capability in our taxonomy. We don't, and the cool thing about it is we don't have to use all of it now, but we've got the placeholders for it, right? That's pretty cool. So I think I'm done with what I wanted to show there. And we'll drill down a little further, and we're going to go to data center hosting and infrastructure. Okay, so you can see this is all the kind of stuff that I might need to consume from the data center. Right? And if I open the bundle compute solutions, this is kind of neat. We got physical, virtual, and cloud. Makes sense, right? And we might have three options here that are bundles, low power, medium power, high power. Could be the same virtually, could be the same in the cloud. It's up to what we want to offer as services. Pretty logical way to go get it. And then let's say, okay, hey, I want to do something in storage. I want to increase my storage or change my storage. So I open up, again, physical, virtual, or cloud, right? And it could be one of these providers. Right? Well, actually, Box and Dropbox, yeah, they are storage. They're also kind of apps, but that's a logical place to put that. Right? So you can see how all that stuff fits together. And I don't think there's anything else that I was particularly interested in showing. No, I think that covers most of it. So now, here's a, I'm going to, that was a, I think that was a pretty good demo for my first demo. So, but yeah, I know I can't hear you guys, so I don't really know how you feel about that. But, now we're going to go, and I'm going to show you this Excel spreadsheet. This is kind of fun. This is actually an extract from that mind mapping software. I can, I can export that taxonomy to an Excel spreadsheet. So you can see all the levels. You can see all the same stuff I just showed you. Right As we go down it, it's all organized. It's all there. But, boy, wouldn't it be hard to build that together using this spreadsheet? It's awful. You know, you'd be, we, we tried it, okay, so it really is terrible. <laughs> so you get down here at the end. And there's a couple of hundred items in this simple example. And this can be then imported into ServiceNow, right? So we're trying to make it easy in going from work, work works really well to design the taxonomy to then getting in and being able to use it. All right, so I'm going to take us back to WebEx. Oh, I'll take us back to the PowerPoint. Okay. Well, I like demoing. That was fun. 
Okay, step four. As we go through this, we reach our last step. And here, this is really pretty simple. You got to use it. You try it out. There's nothing like building a dozen good representative services, placing them where you think they belong in the taxonomy, and learning from it as a, with your small team that you have doing these things. This will help polish your taxonomy really quickly. It's nice. If you want guidance on how to build great services, well, we just happen to have a webinar in the archives you can watch that tells you how to do that. I told you I had a lot of ground to cover, so I'm almost done my part, though. Three pitfalls to avoid. So I want to have a little fun with this slide. And there used to be a comic strip called Pogo a while back, and one of Pogo's famous lines was this, we have met the enemy and the enemy is us. It's true that the big pitfalls are the ones we create ourselves often out of our own inherent IT nature. In truth, they can be the hardest as sometimes we don't even see them. We're so used to them. So this first one, IT navel gazing, is looking IT out rather than customer in. You can't design services customers want and need if you don't talk to them. I realize you think you know what customers want. At least I hear that a lot. But how would you know if you don't talk to them? Start and sustain a dialogue with some key customers as you go down the path of offering IT services. Make it a part of the process you follow for success, and your success will be a lot sweeter. Don't go all wild west on it. If IT, in IT, if some is good, we usually think more is better. So when we have a new exciting idea or project, we go gangbusters. We do know how to build a lot of stuff fast, and we can't wait to get started. So we could build hundreds of rifle shot services really fast with, with little consistency, discipline, or premeditation. Then we would have a confused mess with lots of duplicative services. Slow down, be a little more premeditated, and build with durability for the enterprise in mind. It doesn't take any more work, really, to do it that way. It just eliminates a lot of pain down the road. Last one, don't claim victory too early. The taxonomy is really the easy part. It's just a framework on which you hang services off of. Building the service offering and then delivering those services well in a way that customers love and use them, that's the hard part. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Jeff and he's gonna pick it up from here. Thank you. Thanks, Don, appreciate it. And uh, good job on your first demo. All right, so let me, um, I'm going to start with kind of showing you where in ServiceNow um, kind of some of that taxonomy or that service listing, you know, kind of presents itself from, first of all, from a consumer perspective. So I'm out in our kind of uh, self-service portal. This is built on the content management system of ServiceNow. And we've got two kind of menu options out here, one for service catalog and one for the uh, this little navigation tile. And I'm going to click into here. <clears throat> and kind of the purpose for you know, displaying this list of taxonomy and this list of services is really to, you know, provide some transparency to the customer and, and clarify expectations as to how these services are delivered. Um, and further, you know, these, these service categories and services are, are in a customer-centric language and by which provide the means by which IT can communicate and set expectations appropriately. So some of what you're going to see here, this is, you know, taking what Don showed in the mind map. We've got these high-level categories business applications, communication, collaboration, and then lower level categories thereafter, right? And so this is where uh, we're grouping our different items into different areas and buckets um, and what ways in which to hang those services off. Or the other options I have as a consumer here is I can also look at <clears throat> kind of those services that uh, more I'm a subscriber and a registered user of these particular services. So these are my services. And this can, and that can be attached to these services both from an individual subscription perspective or, or as through a department or a group kind of a, a delegation. Another option I have here is looking at things based off of ratings. <clears throat> so we're providing some options here for uh, the users to, to rate these services either through this portal or as part of the fulfillment activities where we may solicit feedback as to how is that service delivered and the health of that service. Um, and so we can obviously rate these and look at these from a, from a kind of a star and feedback perspective. Further, I can also always sift through the services kind of in an A to Z list to kind of find what I'm looking for. Or what is also more commonly done, I might look for these things based off of um, you know, kind of a keyword, right? So in some of these, you'll notice I'm searching in this case VPN and I get 
private token access. So there's also an element of creating aliases or keywords associated to these services. So you know, I may want to put procurement next to SAP financials, or I may want to put uh, or reverse SAP associated to, pur pur to purchasing. And ultimately, I get down to a service level, and, and the service detail page is going to show me you know, information about the service, kind of uh, what is it, how can I request it, um, what can I expect as far as uh, its availability and, and terms and conditions, um, and also kind of how, what's the health, and also I can also provide here where the, you know, solicit my, my feedback in regards to the service. Let me go into a, a different area here. Let me go back to my taxonomy. <clears throat> And I think I'll go under finance here. And let me go to SAP Financial. So we'll look at this service as another example. So some of the other information that, that you may have defined on these services, in this case you'll see information down below that has what's in scope, what's out of scope, and kind of ultimately the same status information. I may also have additional information that's sourced from our knowledge base to kind of help aid the users answer you know, frequently asked questions or common information about that particular service. Further, I can also look at, let's say, bond trading as an example here. I may also have different offerings or flavors that I may provide as part of my service. And in this case, <clears throat> these offerings also have uh, commitments being made that may be both from a perspective of, of providing clarity as to here's what you can expect, but also might be measurable activities such as uh, the availability uh, of a given service or the responsiveness of support and in, in delivery of, uh, of health, uh, you know, whenever something is, is disrupted or that service is disrupted. Uh, so I kind of showed you here as far as status is the health of the service from a, an individual's service item perspective, but let me show you from a more macro view. We've also got kind of a service health page. So as a consumer, I can come out to this page and I can look and see, you know, how are the different services that I'm depending on performing uh, and how have they been performing? So first of all, I've got a section here for alerts and outages that tell me these are some, some notable events that are going on right now. My, my B2B service is, uh, is currently not operational and actually hasn't been for a few days. Um, so this may explain why some of my data I might be expecting from a partner's environment isn't, uh, isn't in my system or in my, my application that I use. I can also see kind of what's coming as far as maintenance activities and any, uh, any service outages that I may expect. And then lastly, I can kind of look at it from more of a last five days health perspective and I can see things like, you know, my actual uh, B2B has been down for four days this week and is currently still down. So that's kind of the um, consumer view of the service information. Let me shift away to um, kind of the service owner, or the service author side. So kind of back to the native view of service now to author and create records. Um, one thing I wanted to cover before I show you the actual service records on this side is that <clears throat> um, one thing to make this possible is there are a couple plugins that, that can be activated in a service now environment to give you uh, the service offerings, the kind of view of a service definition record, um, as well as defining those different commitments and, and tracking those commitments. So these are really the ones I'm showing are the two plugins that um, you can activate to get that extra information. The first one adds additional tables and records for the offerings and commitments, um, as well as the views and the, and the forms specific to managing kind of those service portfolio uh, service definition records. And the second one creates a linkage between your commitments and SLAs that you may define in regards to incident or, or service requests. And it should be noted too that these are um, the publicly accessible, you know, wiki pages on these on these products or on these plugins that also provide you, you know, a lot of information about how to create an offering, how to create a commitment, and, and so forth. So let's go to one of our service records here. We'll go to laptop support, for example. <clears throat> so you know, this is kind of the, the author side of it. So I've got a form I can edit here. And on my service, I can define kind of who owns it, who supports it, what's its operational status, um, any of the alias information I can define here. Obviously, clarify some of the details about this service. And then here's where that service taxonomy kind of comes into play for the where do I attach this particular service item to our, our classifications and, and taxonomy areas. 
So you notice this kind of mirrors what uh, what Don showed in the mind map as far as different levels of um, of um, classification, and this one's currently attached to PCs, laptops, printers, accessories. All right, and then down below, this is where I get to my service offerings. Um, and in my service offerings, I can go and um, create various commitments uh, that say that are, you know, in some cases, going to be measurable against actual response or resolution time. So let me go create a new one here just so you can kind of see this process kind of end to end. So I'm going to create a new service. I'll just call it uh, Yammer as an application. I'll go ahead and make myself the <coughs> the owner. I'm going to currently say we're not operational yet, and then let's give this a classification. So I see this as something that's in our uh, collaboration area. And I'll just give it some general information and say this is available to all employees. And I will, I'll keep it brief at this point. Start small, grow from there. <clears throat> And then I can, from here, I can go in and create various offerings. So maybe I want to have um, kind of maybe this is a silver versus gold level offering. Maybe there's no price for a silver. And I'll go and attach this to a commitment. And I'll say that for this one, <clears throat> we have a resolution target of eight hours. 24 by 7. Now, one thing to know with this is you'll, once this kind of comes back to the next page, is I can um, go create new commitments on the fly here, or I can uh, attach it to ones that I've already created. So there's an element of creating a library of, of your types of commitments or types of, um, you know, agreements you may be making in regards to living in services. So it's a matter of kind of attaching the different uh, modular commitments to all the different services you offer. So also notice here's where all my subscription information may be uh, attached to these offerings. And let me go just for purposes, I'll create a different service. So we'll make this one cost a little more. So silver's free, gold costs 50 bucks, say a month. And we'll make this one have a slightly higher uh, resolution target. So in essence, we have a service here for, for Yammer-based support that, um, <clears throat> that if it were to have an incident, a priority one incident, if the person was subscribed to silver level, then they would get it within a certain threshold of, of recovery time. And uh, if it's gold, then they get another level. Now, so let me come back out here and show you. So now if I go to my service taxonomy, I go to communications collaboration. Now, one thing you'll notice is I don't have Yammer out here. Now, the reason for this is that I had, when I first created this, I marked it as non-operational. So notice that this is, you, know, you can define these services as you're building them, as you're offering them, as you're designing and proposing them. And then ultimately, once they're ready and, and are actually in an operational status, then we would flip the switch. And then what I would expect to see is now I have my service out here as a consumable service. And also notice I've got it, a little area out here in my portal for things that are newly, newly authored or new services introduced. So as a consumer, I can kind of also see uh, what's also newly introduced in my environment. So the other thing I wanted to show here quickly is, <clears throat> let me go to a different service here, go to PeopleSoft CRM. And you'll notice there's a bunch of dependent configuration items that um, this particular service depends on for its health. And one thing that we've added to kind of simplify this relationship between its components and the actual configure or and, and the service itself is this outage dependency definition. So what we're doing with this particular page is we're basically defining of these items that are in my kind of related list, which <clears throat> which of these items kind of cause if they were to have an outage or a degradation of service cause an outage for my my overall PeopleSoft CRM service. So I can pretty much say no, none of I can turn this off and say. There's no relationship if I have an outage to one of those components, it doesn't have any impact to PeopleSoft CRM. Or I can say maybe I want this to only go down kind of three levels of relationships, and if any one of these items has an outage, then that, uh, that counts. The other thing I can do here is I can actually group some of these items together. And what this is doing for me is a cluster. Is it's going to say that 
that if one of these particular servers were to go down, it would have no impact to my service, but if all three of them were to go down, then my service would be impacted. And I can do the same thing here. Let's say uh, app server cluster. And further, I can also say I want to exclude something. So maybe this network gear device has no impact to my particular service health. All right, so then I save this. <clears throat> Now, if I were to create an outage, which I'll do through incident management here, if I can create an outage against, say, our PeopleSoft database, I'll just get a little description here, save the incident, and let me create an outage from here. Check the same description and I'll say begin outage now. Now what we'll see in my little outage tabs here <clears throat> is by creating this outage for this particular configuration item, it also created one for my Microsoft CRM service app. So let's just say maybe I find out that this actually has been down for since last night. So I'm just going to adjust my time here to say it actually was down last night. One thing you'll notice when I save this is that actually synchronizing these two outages as in treating them as one. Now, from a, um, I didn't mean to close that. Let me go back to my portal. Now, from a consumer perspective, right? So now I should have something new in my service health area, and I do. So notice now, PeopleSoft CRM is down. Database is non-responsive. I also would see something down here now that my, since last night, I've had an outage with PeopleSoft CRM. Now further, from a service owner, what they would do is they'd also be notified that there was an outage for a service that they own and manage, and they may come into this outage record and um, want to provide some more details, right? So they may want to provide you know, service down due to database. We are working to restore service, you know, something like that. And maybe keep updates on a periodic basis. And this becomes kind of a communication tool now. So now out here, some of that information is gonna actually show up in the, uh, in the portal and, uh, and display that, you know, as things are, as things are being updated. So <clears throat> that kind of covered what I wanted to demo, but let me quickly uh, summarize a bit of uh, what's set up in ServiceNow. So, a couple slides here just to highlight um, some of the data relationships that I just showed. So business services at the top um, has a relationship to that in-out scope information. That is modularized. There's, there's records uh, that kind of have a definition of what's a scope item and what's an out-of-scope item. Um, also, the taxonomy is, is connected to the service for this category and then any parent categories, and that can you know, be any numbers of. Um, I showed the CIs in the database and obviously their, their dependency relationship from a health and service impact perspective. Um, and then obviously, uh, and then going down the line here, offerings, each offering has its commitments and subscriptions, as well as its linkages to SLAs and whether those be availability or um, kind of response time. So I'll close with a, a slide kind of summarizing some of the steps from a, a ServiceNow um, kind of setup perspective. So, you know, first of all, we really look to define all business services, you know, in a kind of a basic manner, kind of as I did with that Yammer service. Um, then kind of attach to it the scope, what's in, what's out of scope. Um, if, if, it, if it's applicable, attach different service offerings to those, that, that particular service. You know, those might be gold, bronze, silver, or there may be different variations of that particular service. Um, pricing. Uh, obviously would be in there and that could be something that's more of a showback, could be a chargeback or some other mechanism. Um, and then commitments, right? So these could be linkages to SLAs, they could just be a listing of commitments to kind of clarify what it is you're actually going to provide and, and agree to as part of your service delivery. And then lastly, a link to those uh, configuration items that affect the health uh, and ultimately uh, drive uh, kind of how that particular service is delivered. So that's what I had hoped to cover. So hopefully this was uh, helpful in kind of showing you um, kind of service catalog and sparking some ideas about how to use ServiceNow to support these kind of initiatives. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Uh, we're doing pretty well on time. And I think, we, like I said, we covered a lot of ground today. 
if you uh, if you found this interesting and you wonder what might be a logical next step, here is here are some options that that some are taking advantage of. If you're interested in our advanced employee self service portal, it is available as a ServiceNow update set for uh, for only fifteen thousand dollars. And perhaps, you know, you would like a deeper dive demo for your, you and your team on that. We'd love to support that if you're interested. Uh, within the next couple of weeks, we will have a self-service portal demo you'll be able to log into and play with on your own to your heart's content. And so you won't have to be pestered by talking to us if you don't want to. <laughs> we'll also have an offering with our, our mind map service taxonomy, which we're going to make into a product, and, and that's being formulated right now. Uh, and we'll also have a way that you can come in and, and, and play with that as well. So that's uh, next couple of weeks we'll bring those things out. Uh, perhaps you are, you know, shift gears, you're considering maybe a broader service catalog initiative, but you're not sure where to start, how to get your team on the same page. Uh, for that, we do have a one-day private service catalog workshop that basically educates everyone, gets you on the same page, pulls out the key business drivers, and it creates a logical roadmap going forward. So it can be quite a program accelerator for 3950, which, you know, it's it's also our way to get to know you, and hopefully we can help you in your needs because that you know that barely covers the cost of travel. So we're doing it as well to to get to know you. The uh, lately we're being asked a lot to lead one to two week sort of strategic roadmap engagements around service catalog portfolio and taxonomy to lay out a clear plan. And many of you, when you register for the workshop, you, you list an interest in, you know, hey, this is something we're going to have a project in in the next 12 months. Uh, it's a pretty staggering percentage of you that do that. About 50% claim that there's some need coming up in the next 12 months. So that I guess that would explain why that's becoming more of interest. Again, uh, we're not a high-pressure organization. We'd love to talk to you if, you if you feel like you need help in laying out that kind of a strategy. So that's it for uh, what we've got to present today, and I know we've gotten some questions that have come in. We can go to uh, we can go to questions that we have online. Great, thanks, Don. Uh, so I have a question from Jacob, and he asks: Does Evergreen offer WebEx presentations that focus on UI and customizing the look of the service taxonomy? Uh, yes. The uh, in fact. Some of the early presentations we did, which are in our webinar vault, which you can find on our website, talked about how you build the five keys to building a beautiful UI experience and, and uh, the, the way the taxonomy is actually consumed, right? Because the taxonomy is a framework, but it's the way the service, I'm not, the taxonomy is not consumed, the, the way the services are consumed and how they're positioned to the user based upon their need and where they are, you know, in the portal, right? So there's a... Uh, there's a lot of data on that, and we'll probably be bringing another webinar out about it and updating what we did last time sometime in the next quarter because it's a, it's a topic that still has a lot of interest. Okay, great. Got another question. Don, I think this one's for you as well. Do you find when you start an engagement with a new customer that they want to build their own taxonomy, or do they want you to provide them with a standard taxonomy that can fit into most business models? Nine times out of ten, it is the latter. And because we always started with, you know, a fresh sheet of paper and they would say, well, why aren't you, don't you have a recommendation for us in this area? We can't be that much different from everyone else. And, and I believe that is true. Seventy to 80 percent of the taxonomy components are the same. You know, it really only varies a little bit by the vertical nature of the organization. So that's going to be the starting place. And that's what we've been working toward going forward. Uh, I think it'll make it. I think it'll be a lot better, and, and kind of our operant, operant direction as we're developing, you know, it's kind of a do, it's a different world now, and we're a consulting firm, this is a software product, but clients are trying to buy solutions, and today solutions are combinations of those things that take you further down the road easier and faster with a lot less risk. That's what, that's what it really is about, and so if 70 or 80 percent of what, what you might want in something is the same as someone else, then we're going to try to pre-build that. Right, and bring it with us and then start at that point. And we're continuing to do that and sort of push that paradigm further down the road every day. Great. Uh, Jeff, I believe this question for you it came in from Butler during your demo. Are these service definition pages only available with plugins? So the uh, the plugins, what they provide, or I should say, the, the service, business service records are available out of the box. What you get with activating those service uh, portfolio plugins are 
the the offering records, the commitment records, um, and some of the linkages between those and the SLAs get added. There is a you know some of the the attributes that I was showing on the service page. Um, uh, there a lot of those fields are there, but they're they're kind of organized based off the service owner service perspective uh, when activating that plugin. So it's preferred that you'd leverage the the plugin to uh, uh, to get that service. Uh, author service owner perspective uh, in terms of defining and, and, and editing those services. Okay, great. And Butler had another question. If the outage is resolved but PeopleSoft requires intervention to bring back online, how would you decouple those? So there is a the way the way it was kind of set up is that whenever a service is <clears throat> kind of through that service the outage dependency map and whenever a service is is basically created as an outage from some other related configuration item. There is some synchronization of updates. So, you know, like the, I, I updated the begin time of the outage and that's synchronized to the other service outage. But there is a, on the actual outage record, there is kind of a flag that can be um, kind of unchecked to say don't synchronize updates between the outages. So if it, if it needed to be to where you needed to say that the recovery of the database should not reflect my my PeopleSoft uh, service as being down anymore, then you could uncheck that box and it would, you know, the recovery of that database would have no impact to the other service outage record and it would have to be, you know, kind of, the outage would have to be stopped, you know, separately. Okay, and uh, Robert wants to know, can this in interface with Microsoft System Center 2012 R2? So I'm assuming, um, from a perspective of alerts and outages is what I'm assuming. Um, if so, the answer would be yes. Um, so I guess there's two aspects. There's, um, so you could interface for getting your configuration items uh, from Microsoft tools into ServiceNow, you know, through a, a SCCM integration. Um, you also can integrate with, uh, you know, alert management tools from Microsoft like SCOM to, uh, to push alerts into ServiceNow to create those outages. And then some of our you know, outage dependency mapping uh, activities would, um, you know, just rely on the, the data that was populated externally to drive um, kind of that, uh, I guess, the, the trickle or the spreading of outages to the service. And so I see someone put NetCool as well, and the answer would be the same thing with NetCool. Yeah. There are, and there are, if you look at the ServiceNow site for um, integrations, there are a number of event management tools that have plugins or historical integrations into ServiceNow that can be leveraged to, to populate ServiceNow with the outages. Okay, thanks, Jeff. I think this one's probably for Don. Does or would Evergreen consider offering ServiceNow with your taxonomy and Metro style as a software as a service offering? Hmm. Okay, that's a that's an interesting question that we've actually kind of been discussing as well. Um, if I if I read if I'm listening correctly, uh, it could be bundled with everything, including ServiceNow, uh, for a new customer. Right, that would certainly be possible for existing customers. Uh, it would be also possible, and we have been talking about offering the the Metro style portal because it continues to evolve every week. Right, and we continue to add content to it. We add services. We add things to it. Uh, as a service on an annual basis, and then you would get all those updates, and we would get support when you have questions, and we would get guarantee that it uh, that it works with the next release of uh, of ServiceNow. And uh, yeah, we've been talking about that as well as the taxonomy the same way. Uh, again, this is this solution conversation. It's not just a service. It's not just software. It's a solution. And uh, I think we you know we're interested, and I think we could do it in a way that would be very affordable. You know, our, our kind of thinking behind this is that we don't want you to have to think a whole lot about whether it's worth your investment. We want to make it a price that, that is very attractive, right? And then after you've had a chance to work with it, get your hands into it, you can see the value is pretty self-evident. Okay, great. Don, another question for you. How much risk is there in changing a taxonomy once it has been designed, and how would you do it? Oh, well, that's a good one. I like that one. So the... Uh, the risk is in two areas. You've got the changing and renaming, uh, which affects the expectations of the customers and providers. You know, the uh, you know the common language labels tend to stick in our minds, and we relabel things. It's hard for us as humans to come and change that and use that new label. You know, like Kleenex, every tissue is a Kleenex. 
and you'll find people calling things that are applications that weren't in, that have been out of the business for years, right? So the labels are pretty persistent. And we switch levels, it's hard for folks. The other part of it is the work associated with having to reclassify services into different categories or subgroups, and which isn't awful usually, but then maintaining a consistent history or audit trail where you can say, oh yeah, that used to be in this subgroup and that used to be over here when that question becomes an issue from a history standpoint. So it's not terrible, it's not the end of the world, you know, but it's nice, again, the other, the other view of it is make the taxonomy big right at the start. Get everything you think you can in there because you don't have to light it up. It can just be sitting there. It doesn't even have to be visible, right? And then it makes it easier, uh, you know, as you, as you go down the trail because you don't have to make big changes. Okay, great. Uh, follow um, on, let's see, I've got another one for you, Don. When you say the real work is in the actual services, can you elaborate on what you mean? Okay, so you can kind of get back from what Jeff showed today, too, because he focused a lot on the services, which are the things that hang off the end of the taxonomy, ultimately, right? The taxonomy is, uh, it's really pretty easy. You have to, you know, first off, it's really important to follow a rigorous, rigorously consistent approach when you build services. Okay, if you went to Amazon and the look and feel of buying sneakers and buying electronics were totally different, as a customer, you would be confused and you would be unhappy and you wouldn't come back, right? Your customers are the same. Our customers are the same. So you've got to follow that approach with that framework of building a service. And then you have to design the service itself. So we're going to create this service. We're going to, here's our definition. Here's the delivery timeline. Here's who it fits. Here's who it doesn't fit. Here's what it costs. You know, all those attributes of the service. That's the easiest part. Then you've got to deliver the service consistently in line with the customer's expectation. That's the hard part, right? If you say it's a week, it can't be three weeks. Now, you've got to deliver the service quality, and that means potentially pushing that service execution through the silos of IT, right? And then you want to, and beyond that, you may say, hey, we want to re-engineer and automate this service because there's so much of it, it's a shame to do it manually and clunky. Well, that can be harder too. It takes more time and energy. So that, that's what I mean by saying the real work is in the actual services. Okay, great. Thanks, Don. Jeff, I've got another one for you. Are there any specific ServiceNow licenses needed to support what you demoed? No, uh, I mean, the applications in play that I demoed, just to kind of run down them a little bit, so I showed configuration management, um, service catalog, uh, SLA was kind of in there, right, in terms of, of, of commitments that are response, resolution time, uh, and then content management system is kind of the, the, the portal presentation level. Um, the, even the, and I also kind of highlighted the service portfolio plugins, those are part of that um, CMDB, and they just really, as I said, extend the CMDB application. So assuming you have kind of an IT service automation suite license with ServiceNow, all those parts I demonstrated should be a part of that license. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Another one for you, Jeff. Would we need to establish CI, establish CI relationships in order to set up the outage dependency mapping? Uh, I mean, in, in a way, yes. Uh, I mean, the outage dependency mapping I show really is kind of trying to draw the, the line between the two of what the related CIs, um, kind of how they impact the service. You know, so but but I will say without CI relationships, you can still kind of create that service outage or service health dashboard. It just means you have to create outage records against the given service record that's down or degraded or, or plan for maintenance. You just wouldn't it wouldn't be inherited or spread from from a related CI. Okay, and Jeff, one more for you. You showed a My Services section. How would the user be associated to a service? So it kind of reiterates, so the, the My Services section is really is kind of looking at those service offerings and, and services where I am a subscriber. Um, and, and one thing to note is the subscriber could be tied to an individual, so it could just be me specifically attached to a service, but it also could be a uh, department, a location, a group, or a company, um, and so I can get associated through multiple means. I will say typically we look to kind of build that uh, subscription you know, as part of kind of a fulfillment activity, maybe in the you know fulfillment of getting uh, access to a service. That the, 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 out, the end part of that process may be to register a subscription for the user. Um, I will also say that the, the population of subscriptions could be managed and updated from some external source, you know. So, for example, like I had PeopleSoft CRM, you know, we may populate the, the subscribers from, 
you know, the list of users that are registered inside of PeopleSoft CRM, for example. Okay, one more. And Donna, I've got one more for you, and then we're going to wrap up at the top of the hour here. If we were to build a service taxonomy using the visual mind mapping technology, how would we then get it into service now? Okay, yeah, I, I kind of mentioned that in the webinar the, uh, and, and showed it, but it's worth revisiting because that is a challenge. You don't want to have to do everything manually, and the power of that visual tool is just so great in making this work. So you're able to export it as an, we can export it as an Excel spreadsheet, which we can then draw in to ServiceNow, and uh, Jeff is working on actually a utility to make that even easier, so it's not much work to do so. Uh, we just start, well, we start talking about that today. Uh, <laughs> But it's really not, you know, it's not a difficult thing from that perspective. That's how it would be done. Okay, great. I'm uh, looking. I don't see any other questions, and we're coming right up on 3 o'clock here Eastern Time. So I want to thank everyone for attending. I will get a link out to the recording and the slides no later than Monday morning and hopefully later today. So thank you again for attending. Thanks.